Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals on 17 July 2020 at 2.11 p.m. And one of the favorite ones I have is The Fundamentals in the Faith, published in 1909. We pick up here with Professor Wright complaining, noting the deficiencies in the Graf Bellhausen cultic school. It's talking about Old Testament textual criticism. The translation into Latin known as the Vulgate preceded the Masoretic text by some centuries and was made by Jerome, who was noted as a Hebrew scholar. But Augustine thought it was sacrilegious not to be content with the Septuagint. All this material furnishes ample ground for correcting in minor particulars, the current Hebrew text. And this can be done on well-established scientific principles which eliminate conjectural emendations. The argument has been elaborated by a number of scholars, notably Das, one of most brilliant German young scholars, first in Archive für Religionswissenschaft, and again in an article which will appear in New Kirchle Zeschrift for this year, and is following up his attack on the critical theories with an important book entitled Textkritische Materialen zu Erhenfrage, which will shortly be published in Germany. Although so long a time has elapsed since the publication of this first article on the subject, and in spite of the fact that it attracted worldwide attention and has often been referred to since, no German critic has yet produced an answer to it. In England and America, Dr. Redpath and Mr. Wiener have driven home the argument. See Wiener's essays in Pentateuchal Criticism and the Origin of the Pentateuch. I'm bringing the light of this evidence to bear upon the subject some remark excuse me some remarkable results are brought out the most important of which relate to the very foundation upon which the theories concerning fragmentary character of the Pentateuch are based the most prominent clue to the documentary division is derived from the supposed use of different writers of the two words Jehovah and Elohim to designate the deity. Jehovah was translated in the Septuagint by a word meaning Lord, which appears in our authorized version in the capitalized Lord. The revisers in 1880, however, have simply translated the word so that Jehovah usually appears in the revision wherever Lord appeared in the authorized version. Elohim is everywhere translated by the general word for deity, God. Now the original creation into document, division into documents was made on the supposition that several hundred years later than Moses, there arose two schools of writers, one of which in Judah used the word Jehovah when they spoke of the deity, and the other in the northern kingdom, Elohim. And so the critics came to designate one set of passages as belonging to J document and the other to E document. These, they supposed, had been cut up and pieced together by a later editor so as to make the existing continuous narrative but when, as frequently occurred, one of these words is found in passages where it is thought the, the other word should be used, it is supposed, wholly on theoretical grounds, that a mistake has been made by the editor, or as they call him, the redactor. And, and with no further ceremony, the objection is arbitrarily removed without consulting the direct textual evidence. But upon comparing the early texts, versions, and quotations, it appears that the words Jehovah and Elohim in 
were nearly synonymous that there was originally little uniformity in their use. Jehovah is the name of the deity and Elohim the title. The use of the words is precisely like that of the English referring to their king or the Americans to their president. In ordinary usage, George V, the king, and King George are synonymous in their meaning. Similarly, Taft, the president, and President Taft are used by Americans during the term of office to indicate an identical concept. So it was with the Hebrews. Jehovah was the name, Elohim the title, and Jehovah Elohim, Lord God, signified nothing more. Now on consulting the evidence, it appears that while in Genesis and the first three chapters of Exodus, where this clue was supposed to be most decisive, Jehovah occurs in the Hebrew text 148 times. In 118 of these places, other texts have either Elohim or Jehovah Elohim. In the same section, while Elohim alone occurs 179 times in the Hebrew, and 49 of the passages, one or the other designation takes its place in the second and third chapters of Genesis, where the Hebrew text has Jehovah Elohim 23 times. There's only one passage in which all the texts are unanimous on this point. These facts, which are now amply verified, utterly destroy the value of the clue which the higher critics have all along ostentatiously put forward to divide for to justify the division of the Pentateuch into conflicting G, J, and E documents. And the critics themselves are now compelled to admit The only answer which they are able to give is in Dr. Skinner's words that the analysis is correct if the clue which led it to be false, adding, even if it were proved to be altogether fallacious, it would not be the first time that a wrong clue led to true results. On further examination, in the light of present knowledge as Wiener and Doss abundantly show. Legitimate criticism removes a large number of the alleged difficulties put forward by higher critics and renders no value many of the supposed clues in the various documents. We have space to notice but one or two of these. We'll pick that up again. We turn to Dr. Michael Reeves talking about the post-apostolic fathers and the second apology of Justin Martyr. Soon after Justin finished writing his first apology, three people were beheaded in Rome simply for confessing they were Christians. Justin hastily responded with an appendix to his work. We now refer to this edition as his second apology even though it is not really a second work. Many of the same themes appear, but Justin deals with two more popular objections to Christianity. Since Christians seem to love martyrdom so much, why do they not commit suicide? Number two, why does God not protect Christians? To the first, he responds that while Christians are happy to face death, They live for God's will, which is that they bring life to others. To the second, he replies that even angels cause suffering, evil angels cause suffering in the world, but that God allows it to discipline his beloved. He then turns to the martyrdom objections into a challenge by arguing that the way Christians die is proof that Christianity has the truth that all philosophies and superstitions of men do not have. Dialogue with Trifo is another work by him. 
Justin's last and most substantial work is another apology, this time written, to answer the anti-Christian claims of Judaism. It takes the form of a two-day debate with an educated Jew, Trifo, often thought to be the great Rabbi Tarfon mentioned in the Mishnah. It is clearly not a stenographer's account, yet neither does it seem to be a literary device, as some more skeptical scholars have it. It seems to be an actual dialogue between Justin and Trifo. The dialogue is interesting for a number of reasons. First, we see how strongly Trinitarian justice is. He clearly sees the Father, Son, and Spirit as distinct persons. Second, we are clearly shown the stark difference between the rabbinic Jewish reading of Scripture and the early post-apostolic Christian reading. For Trifo, the Hebrew Scriptures prove that Jesus could be neither Christ nor God. For Justin, those same Scriptures prove precisely the opposite. And moving on to Princeton Theological Journal with our Socinian Sharon Baker on the atonement. In the New Testament as well, the notion of internal sacrifice encompasses practically any exercise in the Christian life, such as prayer, meditation, and worship. In fact, for those holding to Girardian conceptions of the events of the New Testament, the passion of Jesus brings external sacrifices to an end by exposing their hollow and bogus nature. How criminally defamatory is that? It focuses instead on the internal sacrifice of the self. Garinge notes that the heart of Paul's atonement theory is not one in which external sacrifice propitiates for sin, but is a sacrifice of participation in which believers participate in Jesus' sacrifice of self out of love for God and others. Jesus' internal, willing sacrifice of love is participatory, enabling a person to transfer from the lordship of sin to the lordship of Christ. Gorringe continually argues that the New Testament deconstructs sacrificial retributive forms of violence. Fetus expresses the same notion of sacrifice, stating that the saving work of Christ can thus be understood as sacrifice of homage and obedience to God, in which we can join making his act our own. Gorringe notes that in the Johannine letter, the blood of Christ seems to refer to Christ's total self-giving as an internal sacrifice rather than expiation. Shedding blood is a metaphor for the life of love and obedience carried all the way to the end. In addition, reference to the blood of sacrifice in Leviticus 17 denote the internal life of sacrifice rather than the external act of killing. When questioned about the practice of sacrifice in the temple, Jesus responds to the Pharisees with an alternative reading, quoting Hosea 6.6 in support of the internal sacrifice of heart and mind. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice, and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. The active ingredient, therefore, made the passion of Jesus a sacrifice was the internal condition of Jesus' heart and mind, his willing love, not the material elements of death and pain or shed blood or the nails through his hands and feet. The violence of the passion did not please or satisfy God and was considered a crime. As Abelard understood it, the true sacrifice of Christ lies not in the outward shedding of blood, which served to symbolize the internal sacrifice, but in his heart of sorrow, 
sacrifice to God is an afflicted spirit. Jesus, therefore, did sacrifice something. His life and death were a sacrifice offered both to God and to humanity. With a heart freely offered to God and to humanity in love, he sacrificed the right to take his pound of flesh. He sacrificed receiving back what was owed by humanity for the offense of sin. Jesus Christ offered us a sacrifice of cosmic proportion. He sacrificed the balancing of the divine account books and took the loss for the debt we owed and punishment we deserved for sin. And now we're with uh, Dr. J. Fesco, who's touring uh, ex the exegetes of Romans 1, 3, and 4. And he's on now Martin Luther. He's discussed Calvin and Augustine. Outside the Reformed tradition, Luther's 1515 book, Lectures on the Book of Romans, offer another point of view. According to Luther, the passage has, as far as I know, never been explained correctly or sufficiently by everyone. Luther believed that patristic exegetes inadequately explained the text, and medieval theologians lacked the spirit. In a nutshell, Luther argues, the contents or object of the gospel, or as others, Nicholas of Lyra says, its subject is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and now appointed King and Lord over all things in power. And this is according to the Holy Spirit who has raised him from the dead. Luther analyzes Paul's Greek, though he relies on Lorenzo Valla's Ad No Tatianus. That translates Oristentis, declared as definitus, which means chosen, designated, declared, ordained to be the Son of God in power. He also notes that the Son of God became incarnate by emptying himself. He emptied himself when he became the Son of God, but on the heels of his resurrection, he's been established and designated the Son of God in all power and glory. Luther sees the Son's descent and ascent in Romans 1, 3, and 4. The Son's descent into the weakness through the incarnation and his ascent to the revelation of the fullness of his deity in the resurrection. Luther characterizes this pattern as this God is the Son of God, and this man is the Son of God. He even writes of the Son's humanity being completed and translated to divine being. Unlike earlier interpretations of Romans 1, 3, and 4, Luther looked at these verses as explaining the redemptive historical sweep of the Son's incarnation and ministry. Luther writes, But even though it is true that he was not made the Son of God, but only the Son of Man, nevertheless, one and the same person has always been the Son and is the Son of God even then. This fact was not chosen, declared, ordained as so far as man is concerned. He had already received power over all things and was the Son of God. But as yet he was not exercising that power and was not recognized as that Son of God. This was brought about only through the spirit of sanctification. The Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. This man, the son of David, according to the flesh, is now publicly declared the son of God in power, that is, over all things. Whereas the son of man, he was weak and subject to all things. All this was done according to the spirit of sanctification. 
To him is attributed the glorification of Christ as stated above. But the Holy Spirit did this only after the resurrection of Christ. Therefore he adds, by the resurrection from the dead, because the Spirit was not given before the resurrection of Christ. Concordia Theological Journal on Confessional Subscription Reductionist Subscription a number of theologians in the predecessor bodies of the ELCA, such as Karl Broughton, considered the Lutheran confessions to be purely a witness to the gospel. Robert Preuss reported that Broughton claims that we are free today to work out our own approach toward the confessions. He then polemicizes without abandon against any unconditional subscription to the confessions as such. This he calls symbolatry, a term used by Lowe, low, doctrinal legalism, confessional totalitarianism, repristinationism, a kind of doctrinal methodism. This is gospel reductionism in which the content of the confessions is reduced to what might be considered the good news. However, the gospel here was often defined merely as that which gave comfort to the troubled conscience without reference to the specificities of the Christian gospel and the acts of God in Christ, such as the incarnation, the two natures in Christ, with the bodily resurrection of Jesus. This viewpoint does not comport in any way with the actual views held by those who set the Book of Concord out for publication in the Lutheran churches. They committed themselves to the content as well as specific forms of speech delivered in them. In conclusion, we are minded not to manufacture anything new through the work of Concord, nor to depart in either substance or expression to the smallest degree from divine truth. On the contrary, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, we intend to persist and remain unanimously in this truth, and to re rele relegate all religious controversies and their explanations according to it. In addition, we've determined and intend to live in genuine peace and unity. Book of Concord Preface. Footnote 31. Unfortunately, if Lane Grain's wonderful commentary on the Augsburg Confession is affected by this gospel reductionist thinking, when considering the meaning of the phrase consentiri de doctrina evangel evangelii, Green presumes that the verb consentiri means to proclaim or preach. There can be no doubt that the phrase consentiri de doctrina evangelii refers to proclamation, not to correct doctrine. This means that the Augsburg Confession has not yet drawn the consequences from the church schism which were later drawn by Lutheran orthodoxy. Namely, that pure doctrine in the sense of correct theology should be the criterion for a true church. The problem with this is that the confessions do not employ the verb consent theory to mean proclamation anywhere else. Rather, they employ it with precise meaning eschewed by a grain. For example, formula of concord et theosomy ad versii. No biscum in doctrina consentiri nolent. Although the adversaries refuse to agree with us on doctrine, this cannot refer merely to proclamation, but rather to substantive difference in doctrine. We'll pick that up again, moving on to Journal of Theological Studies, 1908, on the discussion about Ecclesia on this rock. I will build my church. 
when the prophets had established the doctrine of election and delivered it to the Pharisees, the word came by its own, uniting as it did in itself the old and new conceptions of God's people. Ecclesia, then, is the kahal, which consists of the chosen people and belongs to Jehovah. Familiarity has dulled the edge of the collection, collocation, build a church. Apart from the appropriation of the word church to a material handmade structure, the metaphor of building is established and accepted. St. Paul uses it as moderns speak of edification. He that prophesies builds the church. For this use, there's ample precedent. Bana, to build or to rebuild, is used figuratively of the establishment and continuance of the household of the Old Testament generally, and by Jeremiah in reference to the restoration of Israel after the exile. The latter use is more obviously a possible source of the present phrase. Thus it is written again, I will, will I build thee, and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. This is from Jeremiah 31. Oikodameso, sakai oikodamathese. But the former use must also be taken into account, though it require that the assembly be regarded as, in some sort, a house or temple. It is an easy transition from kahal to hakala, from the assembly to the temple. The Hebrew words are not equivalent. Um, are not equivalent by the later gematria, which adheres to the numerical value of letters. But the sound of the letter kaf is not easily distinguished from that of kaf. And transposition might be the unconscious achievement of the most careful scribe. To build a temple is the function of Messiah, if he be the son of David. And the new temple, which shall surpass the temple of Solomon, son of David, is in no wise a temple made with hands, but such as is worthy of Jehovah. And we'll move on now to Protestant Reformed Theological Journal on the perfectly simple triune God. He's been dealing with theistic mutualism and the softening, even as he purport or claims, is coming into Reformed churches. One of the outcomes of this revisionist approach is that the God described by the classical theism has been accused of being lifeless. For instance, Richard Swinburne claims that the timeless view of God, God as being outside of and not bound to time, depicts a God who is lifeless. Alan G. Paget says something similar. Is not this God in a box? A changeless being that lives only in a very stretched sense of the word. The life of a changeless, atemporal being is lived only in the space of logical order not in real time. Is this not a problem? Does this kind of God seem anything like the biblical God? I've got a footnote down in here. Dole is all, all that is in God for summaries and com commentary of contemporary Protestant situation on the doctrine of God. See James Dole's all, God without parts, divine simplicity, and the metaphysics of God's absoluteness. Bradford Littlejohn, Introduction in God of Our Fathers, Classical Theism for the Contemporary Church, Moscow, Idaho, Davenant Press, Richard Swinburne, Coherence on Theism, Oxford Press, Alan Paget, Response to Paul Helm, and Gregory Gonzales, God and Time. And now for Augustine on the Trinity. 
Augustine of Hippo once said regarding the study of the unity of the Father, the Trinity of the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit is in no other subject is error more dangerous or inquiry more laborious or the discovery of truth more profitable. Similarly, Jonathan Edwards said that those doctrines which relate to the essence, attributes, and subsistences of God concern all, as it is of infinite importance to common people as well as to ministers to know what kind of being God is. If Augustine and Edwards are right, then such departure from the classical and biblical doctrine of God is highly dangerous. The present article will limit itself to offering a view of the triune God that presents the concept of a family is applicable to the relationship between the three persons of the Trinity. It is here argued that contrary to the false charges of being lifeless and dry, the classical Christian doctrine of the eternal fellowship of the Father and the Son in the Holy Spirit is the very archetypal pattern of life. I will show this by emphasizing the triunity of God. It is the relationships that the three persons eternally and fully enjoy with each other. Even though it is not here argued that this perspective on the divinity will necessarily answer all questions, it will at least show that personal theism's objection of the lifelessness of the eternal and immutable God is unfair at best. Footnote 1 points to Jonathan Edwards. Footnote 2, as it will become clear, this is not an endorsement of the contemporary social doctrine of the Trinity. Quote, social doctrinitarianism is a recent departure from classical Trinitarianism and provides an alternative answer to how God is one in essence and three in person. The three persons are distinguished not by the relations of origins, but by relationships. That is, three persons of each God, of, uh, three persons of God each possess what would be called a personality, including a distinct volitional will, and how these relate to one another is what distinguishes Father, Spirit, and Son. Social Trinitarianism is a seemingly modern innovation and one lacking in biblical warrant. Matthew Emerson, The Role of Proverbs 8, Eternal Generation and Hermeneutics, Ancient and Modern. In Fred Sanders and Squat, Scott Swain, Editors Retrieving Eternal Generation. Moreover, some emphases of this approach tend to consider the three persons of the Trinity as three divine beings against the orthodox formulation of three persons in one being. See David Engel's My Trinity and Covenant, God is Holy Family, for constructive criticism of social Trinitarianism concept of God as holy family life. <clears throat> the presentation will conclude with some brief criticism of the traditional reformed covenantal doctrine. This view sees the covenant of God as a contract or agreement between God and elect humanity, as well as means to the end of salvation. In its place, the present proposal will offer a view of the covenant of God as the very end of salvation itself and intended as a relationship of fellowship sovereignly established by God with his elect people and in this sense, comparable to the relationship of marriage, Ezekiel 16. Bring that to an end as we turn to Thamelios and the wonderful article on the reversal theme in Esther. 
Haman begs for his life. When the king returns, he finds Haman falling on the queen's couch. Here in the fall carries a double irony. Haman falls before Esther in humiliating defeat. The prince becomes a beggar, and yet the king interprets his actions as attempted molestation, kavas, kavash. Molesting the queen was considered a usurpation of the king's authority, and though Haman is begging Esther and not actually molesting, he, he nevertheless dies as a self-exalting usurper's death. The prince who exalted himself against God meets his end when the pagan king mistakenly interprets his falling as an attempt to siege the throne. The ironic confusion leads to Haman's immediate shame. As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Haman's head covering in Esther 6 now becomes a death shroud. Harbona, one of the king's eunuchs, reports that Haman had prepared gallows for Mordecai, the man whose actions saved the king. Then comes the swift order. Hang him on that. The author concludes Haman's fall, writing, so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. That Haman hangs, hala, on the gallows or literally a tree, ace, is a subtle allusion to Deuteronomy 21.23 that says anyone who is hung on a tree is cursed by God himself. Therefore, Haman's hanging on a tree signifies both that Haman has been cursed by God and that the Abrahamic promise, him who dishonors you, I will curse, is upheld in Genesis 12, 3. While this thematic connection of Haman's cursed death does not directly connect to the book of Samuel, it does nevertheless prove that Haman's demise is of divine causality. Haman's attempt to shame Mordecai falls back on his own head, 925, and he dies by the very means he intended to destroy Mordecai. This way, Haman's arrogance-induced fall certainly alludes to the great reversal motif established in the book of Samuel. The lofty Agagite falls before those who sit in the dust. And as will be seen in the narrative's conclusion, those who sit in the dust are raised to princely places. Some footnotes here. Taylor notes that molesting the queen would have been taken as a ploy, commonly used by usurpers of thrones. Taylor writes, Given that Xerxes had a day earlier been reminded of the plot to kill him and siege power, and given that royal wives and concubines were often used as pawns in royal power plays, and given Haman's obvious obsession with honor, success, attention, and the idea of being king for a day, it is not surprising that Xerxes may have believed Haman was intent on usurping the throne. 45. While the actual practice may very well have been impalement, the Hebrew author decides to depict Haman's death as hanging on a tree in order to emphasize that his death was a curse from God. Josephus comments, and hence, from hence I cannot forbear to admire God and to learn hence his wisdom and his justice, not only in punishing the wickedness of Haman, but in so disposing it that he should undergo the very same punishment which he contrived for another, and also because thereby he teaches this other lesson, that what mischiefs anyone prepares against another, 
he without knowing it first contrives it against himself. Mordecai's exaltation in Ex Esther 8, the signet ring that had been given to Haman and all of Haman's property become Mordecai's possession. In this way, the Jew plunders his enemy instead of Haman plundering the possessions of the Jews. An edict is then signed into law and sealed with the king's ring, declaring that the Jews are free to defend themselves against impending attacks. We'll pick that up in our next edition as we turn to New Horizons. Diaconal Ministries Retiring the Backbone of Disaster Response. Retirement is not the end of busy work lives for the men and women of the OPC Disaster Response sends around the country to repair damage dealt by hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods. Church leaders say that these senior citizens make up the backbone of their volunteers. Here are laborers and planners, fixers and rebuilders with years of prior experience and a love of God and neighbor, volunteering out of faithfulness. Retirement is all about life stages, says Jeff Davis, a 61-year-old deacon from Cedar OPC in Jenison, Michigan. You've reached the stage in your life where you have more time and God has provided so well, he said. So you have a thankful heart and volunteer out of forgiveness. Davis had worked in a short line startup railroad, but when it sold, he could make more choices with how he spent his time. He converted to Christianity as an adult. Everything changed, my likes and dislikes. Everything turned around, he described. He married Gloria, a like-minded like partner who had a desire to serve others. Cardiology nurse Gloria was born in Africa to missionary parents. Jeff went to help in Houston in September 2017, and Gloria joined him a month or two later. While Jeff worked as a site coordinator, Gloria served as administrative assistant. She created spreadsheets to track the work and submitted receipts for reimbursement. Later, she said she took on the role of hospitality coordinator for the Houston site. Once volunteers were committed to coming, the volunteer coordinator would pass the information on to me, Gloria said. A church served as a one-stop hospitality center where volunteers had beds, blankets, sleeping bags, and a kitchen where they could cook. Sometimes women of the church brought lunches for the workers and neighbors, and there were potlucks where everybody had plenty of chow, she said. Glory and Jeff worked together in separate parts of the disaster relief. On the job training, Kenley Leslie, who is 73 and lives in Staunton, Virginia, where he's a member of Staunton OPC, said he didn't put retirement and his name in the same sentence. He left a career in computer repair and desktop services at 58, so then he could become involved in volunteer work. He was young enough at the time to perform rough, exhausting work, ripping up wet floors and getting the wood, wet wood out. I'm not skilled in anything. I knew how to swing a hammer and I knew about electricity, Leslie said. I was a good carpenter's helper, plumber's helper, and electrician help, helper. I never said I was good at painting because I was not. <clears throat> John Gordon, 67, and deacon at Calvary OPC in Middletown, Pennsylvania, near Harrisburg, displayed equal modesty by calling himself a jack of all trades and master of none. When it came to disaster work, I had to learn to do something. I was available, and time showed him what that something was. 
Gordon is retired from public school teaching. He's also worked in group homes with dis those with disabilities as in vo volunteered with Joni and Friends, an organization that offers summer camps for families of children with disabilities. We move on now to the Journal of Biblical and Theological Studies, Professor Echeverria. Both unity and indeed Catholicity are already an existing reality, a concrete embodiment given in the Catholic Church. But they are also dynamic realities because in the fullness that the Church received, she is directed toward fullness. Hence, unity as well as Catholicity are both divine gifts and human tasks. Perfect unity and Catholicity will be found only in the eschaton. Regarding the former, the task of restoring unity, Casper notes, unity is flawed because of the divisions. The ecumenical dialogue is to heal those wounds. Through it, the imperfect unity is brought to full unity. The dialogue is not only an exchange of ideas, but also gifts. This is receptive ecumenism. In other words, different theological traditions have developed differently their understanding and confession of God's truth. It's hardly surprising then if from time to time one tradition has come nearer to a full appreciation of some aspects of a mystery of revelation than the other, or has expressed it to a better advantage. Thus they promote the right ordering of Christian life and indeed pave the way to a full vision of Christian truth. Robert McAfee, Spirit of Protestantism, Burkauer, Casper, Echeverria. These traditions of other churches and ecclesial communities have a con contribution to make, though integrating and respecting all their legitimate differences to the Catholic Church, bringing about a fuller and hence more perfect and is Catholic realization is possible of the church. In other words, our non-Catholic brethren have a real contribution to make to the fuller realization of the church's unity and Catholicity, and hence to the fullness of understanding and living the Catholic truth. And now for Reform Presbyterian Journal of 1837, sermon on Exodus, I think it was 43, I just forget now, you, you are witnesses of God. A witness should be impartial. Partiality vitiates the testimony of a witness among men. A witness for Christ should neither regard the frowns nor the smiles of men. The psalmist says, I will speak thy word to kings and not be ashamed. Nathan said to David, thou art the man. And Azariah said to king, said to king Uzziah the king, it appertaineth not to thee, Isaiah, to offer incense, but to the priests, the son of Aaron, go out of the sanctuary. The witnesses shall keep themselves from corrupting bribes. A gift blinds the eye and perverts the judgment. The testimony which the witnesses are to exhibit. The testimony they embrace in general all reveal truth. The whole system of doctrines and duties contained in the Bible. I shall issue, give some few particulars. God's witnesses are to declare that he is the only living and true God in opposition to dumb idols. Idolatry is peculiarly abhorrent in the eyes of Jehovah. He is a jealous God and will not give his glory to another nor his praise to graven images. 
the idolatry of ancient and modern times originated in improper views of a mediator. The witnesses for Christ should testify not only against heathen, but against anti-Christian idolatry. Warnings against popery are now less frequently given than in the days of our forefathers against all the usurpations and encroachments of the man of sin ministers should lift up the warning voice number two the unrestricted reading of the bible the bible is god's gift to man it is a lamp suspended from the arch of heaven to illuminate the path of the traveler to the new jerusalem to interfere with the free circulation of the word of God is as arrogant and presumptuous as to attempt to restrain the genial influences of the luminary of the day. The word of God is not bound. We should pray and struggle that it might have free course and be glorified. Expediency is substituted for duty in these eventful times. Great Britain has given its power to the beast to silence the clamors of popish demagogues. The rulers of this land have, in effect, consented to banish the Bible from the schools of the nation and thus to leave the rising generation the dupes of ignorance and misrule. At such a time, the witnesses should not be silent lift up an uncompromising testimony for the free and unadulterated circulation of the Word of God. Delightful article. Turning now to Southwest Theological Journal and Dr. Beale on the various uses of the Old Testament in the Apocalypse. Old Testament segments as literary prototypes Sometimes John takes over Old Testament contexts and sequences as models after which to pattern his creative compositions. Such modeling can be apparent from a thematic structure that is traceable to only one Old Testament context or from a cluster of clear allusions to the same Old Testament text. Sometimes both are observable, thus enhancing the clarity of the Old Testament prototype. It has been argued in some depth that broad patterns from Daniel chapters 2 and 7 have been followed in Revelation 1, 4 to 5, 13, and 17. Chapters 1 and 4 to 5 exhibiting both elusive clusters and structural outlines from segments of Daniel. Incidentally, this would show f further design in these chapters. That's some footnotes. Comiskey, alteration of Old Testament for an attempt to perceive degrees of Old Testament contextual awareness based on the determinative intention of John in the light of his own context and revelation, though Komsky de-emphasizes uh, the role of the Old Testament too much. Fiorenzia, Beal, Yusso, Daniel. Um, back to it. Incidentally, this would show further design in these chapters and point further away from the unconscious use of the Old Testament. The same use of Daniel as a Midrashic model is also observable in Jewish apocalyptic works, indicating that this kind of use of the Old Testament was not uncommon. The suggestion is also made that this influence of Daniel may even extend to the stru structure of the whole apocalypse since allusions to Daniel 2, 28, 29 punctuate the book at major divisional transitions, 1, 1, 1, 4, 1, 6. 
Furthermore, the five apocalyptic visions in Daniel cover the same time of the eschatological future. We'll move on to the Reformed Theological Journal and the discussion about Eugene Patterson. In a later work, Pat Peterson, not Patterson, Peterson asserts that scripture can center the disciple only when one devotes attention to its form. The way the Bible is written is every bit as important as what is written in it. For this reason, Peterson advocates in many places the importance of praying the Psalms. Praying the Psalms keeps us in a school of prayer that maintains wakefulness and an open ear, alertness and an articulate tongue, both to the word of God and the voices of praise and pain of God's people. And yet we must go be even beyond praying the Psalms. Throughout long obedience, Peterson directs the reader to focus on the form of the songs of ascent. These are songs for the way. And in almost every chapter, there is reference to a song. Singing 15 psalms is a way both to express the amazing grace and to quiet the anxious fears. Psalm 121 learned early and sung repeatedly in the walk with Christ. Clearly defines the conditions under which we live out our discipleship. The Psalm 124 song is at the heart of our subversion, is at the heart of our subversion of the world. We speak our words of praise in a word that is hellish. We sing our songs of victory in a world where things get messy. We live our joy among people who neither understand nor encourage us. Finally, our song is an expression of joy. God is not our salvation if he's not our song. And to the songs of a sense or a communal songbook, as he later expresses it, song, song brings our prayers into rhythm and harmony with the other members of the community. How can we pray accurately for and harmoniously with other members of God's people? Through song, song establishes all members of the congregation in an organic relationship. The Christian recovers a sense of community and experiences the dynamic of community through the music of liturgy. The popularity of Peterson's book presents a challenge in assessing his legacy. Where does he fit in the reformed and evangelical landscape? Nathan Finn describes three broad streams of spirituality among contemporary writers. The first is the evangelical holiness traditions, by which Finn refers to the voices in the Wesley and Higher Movement. He includes Peterson in the second camp, an eclectic and ecumenical group concerned with spiritual formation the chief voices of which are Richard Foster and Dallas Willard. The third category, God-centered, gospel-centered spirituality is more theologically oriented <clears throat> and at least implicitly reformed and features J.I. Packer, Jerry Bridges, John Piper, and Donald Whitney. Bringing that here, switching now to Princeton Theological Journal, 1837. We admit that if the opposers of the proposed organization spoke as this gentleman writes, it would be no matter of surprise that their meaning was not apprehended. We've read the two chapters of his book relating to this subject at least three times consecutively from beginning to end besides repeatedly reading and comparing one paragraph with another, and we seriously say we do not know what he means. We have no ground, we have no idea what grounds he intends to assume as to the power of the assembly in relation to the missions. 
we've been accustomed to give to ourselves credit for about the average amount of common sense and therefore conclude if the author meant common people to understand him, we should be competent to the task. But we confess ourselves completely foiled. One, at one time, we think he means to admit everything, the constitutional right of the assembly to conduct missions and to appoint a board for that purpose. Thus, on page 79, he admits that the assembly has a right to conduct missions, that this right is not only conferred on it by the Constitution, but belongs to it from the nature of the body as the supreme judicatory of the church. He calls this a constitutional and inherent right. The same admission is made on page 90 where he acknowledges also the assembly has power to appoint a board of missions and recommend it to the confidence and patronage of the churches. Number two, sometimes we think he intends to deny the right of the assembly to organize a board of missions and means to confine its power in the premises to conducting missions of their own knowledge and while in session. Thus, in page 80, he says, the Constitution asserts the right of presbyteries, synod, and general assembly to conduct missions. But this right is asserted under certain restrictions. Either of these bodies may send missions to supply vacancy and answer to applications from presbyteries or from vacant congregations with the leave of the presbyteries and is manifestly intended that the application shall be made to these bodies themselves. We bring this to a close. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.